So it's uh, our theme for this year. What is our theme for this year? Keeping step with the Spirit and enter the promise together, right? Um, you know, uh, I, I've been gone for a whole month, and, and it's funny, right before we left, we, we, did our, uh, we moved back to our old house. <laughs> Last year, the same thing happened. So like before I went on my trip, the, the, two nights before, we moved into our new house. And then this year, we moved back to our old house, and then uh, two nights before, we, uh, I, I left for the trip. And uh, it's really, really funny how things work out. And I, I won't go into depth why we moved back to the new house, our old house. And uh, it's a long story, real long story. And, and on the day to, to the airport, uh, Pastor Bill picked us up, and, and I had to go to the, uh, to the old house to pick up some things because I, I, we, we just missed some things, right, in, in, the whole, in the whole move. And I, I didn't have certain things with me, and I had to take it with me to, the, to Asia. And so, so he was waiting for us at, the, uh, at my house, and then uh, we, we went to the airport late. We got to the airport. He thought we couldn't make it to, uh, to the flight. And uh, well, I, never, I had never been late for, especially international flight. You know, we always at least two hours in advance, but this time around it was kind of really tight, really tight. And it turned out we made it in time, but we were a little late. I got to, um, to the check, check-in stand, and... Uh, they put me at the emergency row, you know, because, uh, yeah, so, so it, it, was, it was good leg room, actually. It was nice, nice. Uh, the flight was really nice. But as soon as we started the journey, right away, the Lord began to work. I had this lady sat next to me, and uh, we spent the whole time talking about her questions about faith, about God, the whole time, about almost 12 hours, almost 12 hours <laughs> just talking. I was tired by the time we got there. But praise the Lord, she had all her questions answered. And so I invited her to the church. I was, we, we, we all uh, t t took the same flight. We went to Shanghai uh, and then uh, transferred to Manila. She, she happened to be going to Manila as well. She's from mainland China, from Beijing area. Actually, she f from Beijing went to France and then uh, later on relocated to uh, Manila. And she was doing business in Manila. So we, we you know, uh, I invited her to, to the church I was speaking at in Calocan, which is a small little province uh, in the northeastern part of uh, Manila. And she came to the church and brought four of her friends to church on Sunday morning. Okay, so it's a pretty amazing, right? And then on Monday, she invited us to go to her uh, office because she wanted to know more. So on uh, Monday morning, I brought, you know, brought my friend who, who traveled along with me. He's uh, Jack Wolf. You guys have seen him before. He's from Dallas. So we went to her office, and there she accepted the Lord to her life. She accepted Christ, and uh, we got to witness in her office, two of her offices. There we minister, uh, gave two testimonies in her office in both places. And uh, a week later, she attended uh, the retreat I was speaking at in Manila. Uh, in the city of Baguio, and there um, she got baptized <laughs> in Baguio. So praise the Lord, praise the Lord. You know, um, so she's coming back to the States, I think, in the uh, end of April. Maybe she will have an opportunity to give her personal testimony here in the church. But uh, just uh, every trip I go out, I'm, I'm so amazed by God how much grace, how much God's mercy is, is with us. You know, I, I'm not just saying when you go on a mission trip, that's the only time when you're going to experience God. What I'm saying, though, is that when you step out by faith, when you do step out by faith, He always meets you where you are. Amen? So, so right off the bat, we started the start of ministry right at the plane, right? And, and praise God. And we had an uh, opportunity to go to, uh, went to Manila first, and then went to Singapore, and from Singapore back to Manila. From Manila, went to uh, Zhengzhou in China, and then went back to Shanghai to visit Bonita, and I'm back here. A lot of ministry nonstop. We got back last night, so praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Can we pray? Praise, uh, Father God, I just want to thank you. Thank you for the amazing, amazing things you bring. Now, most important is not what you bring is, but who you are, and, and, and that you always, you're always there for us, and, and you, you've been an amazing God. I just want to thank you once again for your, uh, the amazing journey you've given me, and, and I'm, I'm here to share with my brothers and sisters what you've, what you've done um, in my life, and, and, and I'm, I'm sure, Lord God, you're going to do amazing things in their life. 
And uh, so we bless our time here together, and will you send your Holy Spirit and, and move us, move us and, and shape us in, into um, the true disciples, disciples that follows your heart. So in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Oh, are you guys tired? <laughs> oh, man. Um, you know, sometimes Sunday mornings can be really exhausting for some people. Uh, because you have a whole week, you know, a whole week of school and work, and then you kind of just let your guard down a little bit on weekends, right? And then t t Saturday, Sunday is kind of, kind of a sluggish, you know. Um, but uh, well, we're gonna have a wonderful time together, all right? So should we turn to John chapter eight together this morning? The message is truth will set you free, all right? Tell the person next to you, truth will set you free. And make sure you put their name in there. Say, James, truth will set you free. That's right. Or <laughs> truth will set you free. And that's from John chapter 8, 31 through 38. My friend, what is true freedom? What is true freedom? And I want to tell you right now, right off the bat, true freedom is allowing God to fill you. Allowing God to fill you, and as you live out the fullness of God and the purpose of God in your life, that's true freedom. All right? A, a lot of people say, I want freedom. You know, young people today, teenagers come and say, I want some freedom, right? Come on, some say amen. <laughs> You're not a teenager anymore, Jerry. Just <laughs> No, a lot of young people say, I want some freedom. Somebody say amen. Come on. Okay. But what, what is freedom? A lot of times, freedom just doing what I want to do. You know, that, that's kind of freedom we want. Doing what I want to do. And, uh, and, and that, that's a kind of freedom, yes, it, it is, but, but it, it's a bit selfish, isn't it? Freedom without responsibility is selfish expression. It's a very selfish expression. But the true freedom in Christ Jesus is to live out what God intended for us. See, when God created us, He intended something beautiful for us. And if we try to do things on our own with the absence of God, what happens? We live out a kind of reckless life. We live out a reckless life, and with a reckless life, we, we find ourselves in a wreck. Okay? Reckless life leads us into a wreck in life. That's what happens. And so true freedom is to live out God's intention for your life because His intention is actually a partnership. Say it with me, partnership. It's a partnership of God and you. Your heart aligning with God's will for you, and you live out the fullness of life. And some of us don't understand what that means yet. We have yet to experience that fullness of life. When God gives you that, and you can really say, wow, I'm actually free. You're actually free because you act. this is what you're supposed to be. See? You're supposed to be partnering with God. And when you live out that life, it's a beautiful life. I guarantee you. And the Bible talks about the fullness of life. And it is a life of freedom. It pro he promised fullness of life. And that's a life of freedom. It's not, it's not unrestrained, reckless. And you find yourself in a wreck all the time. It's not that kind of life. It is a life full of His grace and beauty and creation. Creativity is full of your life going to be there. You're going to find that. Okay, so truth will set you free, and we're going to add, focus on a certain aspect of what that looks like in, in John chapter 8. All right, so if you have your Bible open, and let's look at chapter 8, verse 31 together, okay? Are you there? Do we have it on the back or no? It's okay? All right, some people don't have their Bible, so we're going to be looking at the screen. Chapter 8, verse 31 says, if you have the Bible, you can read with me on NIV. says, to the Jews who had believed him, Jesus said, if you hold to my teachings, you are really my disciples. One more time. To the Jews who had believed him, Jesus said, if you hold to my teachings, you are really my disciples. Here we're able to distinguish what is a true disciple of Jesus. Okay, what is a true disciple of Jesus? I want you to ask yourself, am I a true disciple of Jesus? Am I a true disciple? A disciple is a follower of Jesus. Are you a true follower of Jesus? 
And here are some distinguishing marks. First of all, Jesus is speaking to some Jews. All right, Jews traditionally always believed they are the people of God. They're chosen ones of God. All right, God's chosen people. Now today, Christians believe that they're God's chosen people. Amen? All right, so here there's a differentiation. Jesus is not just speaking to Jews. He's talking to what kind of Jews? Believing Jews. These are Jews who had believed in Jesus. Uh, are there people that are believers, that are considered some, themselves people of God that, that don't believe in Jesus? Yes, they are. Some people, they believe in God, but they have no understanding of who Jesus is. They have no relationship with Jesus. All right, so, so Jesus is speaking to a bunch of religious people who believe in God, and they also believe in Jesus. And he's saying to them, if you hold to my teachings, you are really my disciples. So, so in other words, of all the people who call themselves believers or religious people who believe in God, there are some people who who's, he's speaking to. These people actually believed in him. Who actually believed in him. And, and uh, to these people, he's saying, if you hold to my teaching, you're truly my followers. Are you with me so far? Now, I want to make it a differentiation, okay? They, they, there are a lot of people, they call themselves Christians, and some people grew up in a Christian family, they call themselves Christians growing up. Some people believe because they're American, therefore they are Christians. Are you with me? Okay? So just because we're American, some people think that we're Christians growing up here in America. Now, there's a, that's a difference between the first generation, first generation Christians versus the second generation Christians, or third generation, or fourth generation, or generational Christians, or, or maybe cultural Christians. Are you with me? You understand? There's a difference. The difference is, I think number one is that you actually believe in Jesus. You actually believe in Jesus. Not just because you're, you're labeled Christian, but you, you grew up Christian, or, or grew up with a Christian value, or grew up church, or grew up with Sunday school, or you grew up in a ch church fellowship. That's... See, there's a, there's a difference. Even among the Jews, there's a difference. So Jesus is talking to those Jews who believed in him. And he's saying, hey, even among you guys, religious folks who go to church on a regular basis, who call yourself Christians, those who believe in me, I want to make a differentiation. I want you to know, if you hold to my teaching, then you're truly followers of mine. Okay? Uh, the, the point here is not to say you're a follower or you're not a follower. The point is that if you really want to follow Jesus, this is what you want to do. The, what, does, what does it mean to, to be holding to my teaching? In other words, you must first of all believe in his teaching enough that you actually put it into what? Put it into practice. Put it into practice. More, uh, it's, it's less about what he says. It's more about what you're doing about what he says. Are you with me so far? Okay. I, I, I think being a, in a Western context, being in a very Western context, you know, the church has been in the West for 2,000 years. But put your finger up for 2,000 years. That's a long, long time. Okay? The church has been with the West for 2,000 years. For 2,000 years, we've been living with a mindset. And what is the mindset? Rationalism. Rationalism. Okay? What does rationalism have to do with our religion? Is that everything we're trying to rationalize, right? Try to make sense of it. Now, there's nothing wrong with making sense of things. But if we emphasize on rationalism so much, to the point of exaltation of rationalism, and all we have left is the understanding, the knowledge of truth without the experiential element of truth. Are you with me? Are you with me? So, so because most of our education focuses on this rationalistic way of, of living, rational way of thinking, the way everything has to make sense. And, and then, of course, you know, most, most things we do are, are reasonable, make sense to us, okay? But, but for 2,000 years, the church has been focusing our attention 
on this understanding of things, forgetting the living out of things. Are you with me? And so what Jesus is critiquing, not just critiquing, but bring our focus back onto living out. Living out. Living out the spirit of Jesus' life. What does it mean to follow Jesus? You have to believe in what he says, but also what? Live out what he's saying. Now, what is the spirit of Jesus? Um... So there are disciples that don't follow his ways, that prescribe to his teaching, but does not follow his ways. A real disciple would do, would hold to Jesus' teaching, would do his things. So let's focus on, I think I'm losing my voice. Let's read verse 32. You guys have 32 with you? Or on the screen? Can somebody read it? One more time. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Now this time I want you to say it to another person. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Amen. Now, without this living out, you will not know the truth. You will not know the truth. Because the word to know in Greek is an intimate knowledge. It means that there is an intimate it's an embodiment of the knowledge. It's not something that you understand in your head, but it is something that is intimate in your life. Okay? In our understanding of uh, the, the, this concept of knowledge, in our study of knowledge, there is something called the propositional knowledge. Are you with me? Versus the experiential knowledge. What is a propositional knowledge, guys? Propositional knowledge is knowing about the facts, knowing about the facts, no knowledge about the, uh, of that such and such is the case. It's a textbook kind of knowledge. You know, think about most of our Christianity, most of our, our religious experience is pretty much kind of narrowed down on a few things. How much do you know about the Bible? How, how much do you know about, the, uh, about God? How much do you know about the theology of God? You know, so, so we have the Old Testament, the New Testament, how many books of the Bible? Come on, you guys. I mean, there's a lot of knowledge that we accumulate over the years. And even, even our Bible studies, we, we focus so much on the knowledge, focus on what we do know. All right? And that's all propositional knowledge. It has nothing to do with experiential knowledge. See, our theme for this year is to be in step with the Spirit. You know, being in step with the Spirit has a lot to do with this, this motion. You, you have to be doing something in motion. Now, the Spirit of God leads to the knowledge of God. And the truth of God is not just propositional. The truth of God is experiential. It is something that you embody. Once you, once you know something to be true and you, you take a step out and you start experiencing something, and guess what? You have the intimate knowledge. Not just the propositional knowledge. Okay? And that, that's not what Jesus is looking for. Jesus is not trying to teach us more propositional knowledge because most of these people grew up with a lot of Bible. Okay? Trust me, the Jews know the Bible. The Jews know the Bible very, very well. And he, they don't need another Bible lesson. You know, in, 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 in the Pentateuch. They don't need that anymore. And I feel the same thing is true about Christianity today. I don't think people need to know more about the Bibles. Maybe some do. But most people actually need to be taught to de-emphasize knowledge of the Bible. I think we all had too many Bible studies. Somebody, somebody say amen. <laughs> what I mean by that is, is that if all we do is ex just, just having this propositional knowledge, what do you think it leads to? It leads to arrogance. It, 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 it leads to a headiness. A, a really, really big head. You know, what are the most, most arrogant people that you know? Those people who knows everything. The more you know, 
the more arrogant you become. Okay, the, the most highly educated folks are the most arrogant people you can talk to. I've, I've been in, in a debate or a discussion with, with this, uh, this PhD, okay? I'm not, I'm, I'm not putting down PhD folks. I'm, I'm just, I, I know a lot of PhD. And I, I've been in a debate with PhD folks. And then and the first thing they, they'll throw at you is, okay, look, I don't think we're talking at the same level, okay? You know, have you read these books? Have you read these books yet? If you haven't read these books yet, I don't think we're... We're, you know, we're in a different class here, okay? Just want to be honest with you, all right? Um, and and I, I don't think you have the right degree, all right, for us to be engaging this dialogue, all right? And, you know, they're, they're, they're smiling and they're really comforting you. You say, it's okay, just, it's going to take a few years to get to where I'm at. <laughs> you, you know what I'm talking about? Now, now people like that, I'll say, huh, yeah, yeah. Okay, <laughs> I really don't want to engage in a dialogue with folks like that. There's no point. See, the Bible says knowledge, what? Puffs up. But so you see, the more you have knowledge, a proposition of, of God, a proposition of knowledge of God, the more you need the experiential knowledge of God. But when you have the experiential knowledge of God, what happens to a person? <laughs> she says power, but I... I say, uh, I say the first thing when you have the experiential knowledge of God is humility. In the past, I've known God. I've heard of God in a propositional way. But once you, once you meet God face to face, guess what? Humility comes. Humility comes. Every time there is propositional knowledge, it must be met with experiential knowledge of God. Without that kind of balance... Oh, you'd be dangerous with knowledge. You know, having so much knowledge with no humility, without some experiential knowledge, you're a very dangerous person to be with. There's a lot of Christians that are very dangerous people. You know what I'm talking about? They're very dangerous people because they can kill. They can kill everything around them. They're like a nuclear bomb ready to explode on people. Unleash wisdom on you. I'm going to unleash my wisdom on you. And boom, you, you feel like an idiot right in front of them. You, you become like a tiny little rat. And then you're chased by this big giant size, giant size uh, cat. And then you, you hide. And then sometimes uh, you get beaten up so bad. You know they win, but you know what? Inside you say, if every Christian's like that, I'm not going to be a Christian. If that's what it means to be a Christian, even though they may be right, it sounds like they're right, but I don't want to be a Christian. Are you with me? Do you understand what I'm saying? Christians can be very dangerous if that's all we have is propositional knowledge. Proposition of knowledge. What is a real disciple? A real disciple is someone who's intimate with the Lord. Not only do they have the proposition of knowledge, but they have the, the experiential knowledge that goes along with it. They know who God is and live out the spirit of Christ rather than just the teaching of Christ. They live out the spirit of Christ. And guess what? You know the truth by then. What is truth? You become the embodiment of truth in your own life. You know that brings a lot of humility. Brings a lot of humility. This is where Jesus is incarnation. He is the Word in flesh. Isn't that all we're called to be? Isn't that what we're supposed to be? Isn't that the truth embodiment in our own lives? And that's power, right? Isn't that power? And, and then that's the true power. And, and that's true freedom. True freedom is when you allow the work of God to be part of your everyday living. Everyday living. And, and, and the truth is, it's, it's very difficult. What's difficult? Letting go. 
letting go of our old ways, our old self. And I think the passage kind of reminds us right away. Okay, so here it goes on to uh, verse 33, 34. Can we read together? They answered him, We are Abraham's descendants, have never been slaves to, of anyone. How can you say that we shall be set free? Jesus replied, Very truly I tell you, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. Okay, that, that time on right here. <laughs> Somebody wants it so eager to go on. I know, I know, I know, me too. I really want to keep moving. But see, this passage right here, it reminds us um, that we're all slaves to sin. See, the way these people reply to Jesus, they, they, they say, Jesus, don't you remember? We're Abraham's descendants. Of course Jesus knows this. I mean, he, he's a Jew himself. We're all Abraham's descendants. And then we have never been slaves to anyone. Come on, how short memory can you be? 400 years, these people were enslaved in Egypt. Amen? But Jesus is not even talking about that. Jesus is saying, you're enslaved by sin when you sin. Now, how many of us are reminded that we're sinners? Descendant of Abraham. Hmm. How many Christians think that they're still enslaved by sin, even today? Church-going, Bible-believing Christians still believe that they're enslaved by sin. Hmm. See, most people think they're descendants uh, by birth. Okay? By birth. Some people believe that they're in, inherited th this faith because of baptism or communion or following certain tradition or saying the sinner's prayer. Right? Some of you believe that's what you are. You're a Christian because you pray the sinner's prayer and you go to the church and you partake on the communion and you, you're baptized and, and you're, you're in a Christian family. You're a Christian church. So, so you see, we appeal. We appeal to certain things. We appeal to certain things to, to claim our rights. Abraham's descendants. That's what they call themselves. I am a born again. I'm a Christian. We appeal to certain things. But what Jesus is saying, he's talking about, are, aren't you a slain, enslaved still by sin? Um, in this past, past month, I've been traveling with a, a, another brother who's 68 years old, and he, he decided to travel with me on this trip. His name is Jack Wolf. You guys seen Pastor Wolf? All right. It, 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 we, you know, everywhere I went, he says, uh, I, I joke, joke, his, uh, joke about his name. Is a wolf in sheep's clothing. <laughs> the last name is Wolf, <laughs> but he says I'm a, I'm actually a sheep in wolf's clothing. But uh, uh, so so I joke about that. But see, you know, he is he is an American, all right. Just just like we're all American, but but he's from Dallas, Texas. Now now Texas feel that they're a, a nation of their own, okay? That they're te Texans. They're unique. They have. Uh, their own ways, and they'll admit it. Most, most Texans would, would admit that they're highly, highly individualistic. Okay? They, they believe that they're uh, just unique. Uh, they're not just normal Americans. They're Texan. Um, well, he has some experience in Asia. And he's traveled to India and he's been to uh, China numerous times. Uh, and in fact, we met two years ago in China. Uh, in, in an international camp. So in, in this whole journey, um, can somebody say it's kind of difficult to travel with somebody? Okay? Um, especially people that you, uh, you don't know and you're traveling together for a whole month, living together every single day. You eat every meal together. You sleep in the same room. It's just hard. Come on. Somebody say yes. Amen. It can be hard, okay? So no matter if you're pastors, missionaries, and you travel together with somebody for a whole month, whoo, <laughs> it's just hard, okay? But if it's, it's my, my experience with, with Jack, I'm not just bad-mouthing. He will admit, with, uh, admit what my experience uh, in Unison, I think, is that um, it, it, was, it was challenging in, in a lot of different ways. You know, be, he's him a Texan and, and not very accustomed to the Asian culture. Hello? 
Okay, there are certain conflicts that comes as a result of that. All right, so so this is what he tells me. He says, James, uh, I'm not in America anymore. I'm in Asia, and I'm gonna do everything Asian way. Okay, and so so when we when we go to a place, uh, I said, oh, can we go to Burger King or McDonald's? He, he said, no, I can do that in America. I don't need to be eating American. I'm gonna try the local stuff, right? But the truth is, the truth is. He has to have coffee in the morning. <laughs> he has to have coffee in the morning. And we, we'd be walking into a Chinese store, and there we have some dump, dumplings, and we have some of those, uh, you know, oily stick thing, you know, you know what that is? And then, and then all these different um, soy milk and all that, right? And he'll be looking at that menu and said, oh, um, you know what, you guys eat. I, I don't eat breakfast. <laughs> And the truth is, he has a hard time with that, right? He has a hard time taking in all that. And, and I, I just right away know, and, and I said, you know what? Maybe we should just go to Starbucks. Just go to Starbucks. All right. And, uh, and that's just one thing, you know. And, and then, of course, he, he can't eat anything with a head on it, right? Like a fish with a head or a shrimp with a shell. And, and so, so every time when we, when we go to a restaurant, we have to order fried rice. <laughs> Guess what? Fried rice and soy sauce. <laughs> the whole time, every meal, fried rice with soy sauce and coffee in the morning. <laughs> Excuse me. Excuse me. I caught a little bit cold when I was in Sarangani up in the mountains. But uh, <laughs> that's what he had to eat. Every, every meal, fried rice with soy sauce. And, I, you know, understanding him, uh, I, I, before, before I met up with some of these folks, I tell them, say, you know, there's, don't order the, your normal stuff. Don't order the, you know, in the Philippines, there's tons of seafood. That's going to kill them. <laughs> you, can't, you can't eat seafood because you're Texan, right? God, God. I'm not making fun of Texan. I'm just, you know how we are. Every, everybody's got some issues, right? We got some issues. Some, somebody have to eat Indian food. <laughs> Come on. Somebody say amen. <laughs> somebody have to eat rice. Anybody have to eat rice every meal? Man, I, I, I hope we're a little more um, accustomed to diversity, but, but that's, that's how we are. No, when it comes to food, culture stands out. Isn't it? But isn't it true with our lives? We have certain things that kind of, kind of trap us and, and, and put us in a box, whether it be culture, whether it be traditions, whether it be certain values. You know? I, I know we're all laughing, but, but aren't we all trapped by some things? You know? Some habits of yours, some things that you, you know that you can't change about you, you know? Um, when you say, I can't change, and maybe admit to that, and that's probably a good starting point for some transformation. When you're in a denial, say, you know what, I'm okay, I can do anything. It's just like maybe having Pastor Jack go to Asia and say, you know what, I can do anything you Asian can do. Well, then we, we tested him on Baloo. Do you know, guys know what that is? Do you know what that is? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> he got scared, okay? <laughs> he got scared. You know what that is? As, uh, you want to tell us what that is, Mike? It's an unborn duck inside a sheep. Okay, it's a... It, 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 it's a yeah, a little feather coming out of it, and then uh, he, he, he didn't even touch it. I mean, he just look at that. And I said, you know, you, could you at least make an attempt to try? Nope. <laughs> he, wouldn't even, <laughs> he wouldn't even touch it. He got scared. I mean, there's a lot of stuff in our culture that, that we're, uh, we're just not able to step out of. But, but the, starting point, the starting point for true transformation is acknowledging that you are trapped in your own ways, in your own culture. But the stubbornness of a person saying, I will not change, I can't not change, is true enslavement. Are you with me? True slaves say, I cannot change. 
I will not change. That insistence of not being able to change is what enslaves us. And oftentimes, that is the tyranny of the self. Are you with me? You say, I cannot change. Who is stopping you from changing? You. I cannot change. You. The tyranny of the self is what stops us from growing. And, and oftentimes, we don't even recognize that we're doing that. And guess who's suffering? Everybody around you. Everybody around you. Because you are a slave and you enslave yourself and you enslave those around you because you can't eat but loot. Therefore, nobody can eat but loot. Because you can't eat dumpling, therefore, nobody else can eat dumpling. Are you with me? Your, our, our inability stops others who love us, who care about us, who, who's walking with us, experience more freedom. Sometimes our own inability becomes a trap for those around us. Do you see that? Do you see that? And we're, we're not, when we say sin, when we talk about sin, I say, how can you say food is sin? Food is not sin. But what I'm hoping that we can find ourselves is identify those things that we're that are enslaving us. Starting place can be food. How about our personality? Our, 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 our idiosyncrasies? You know? I, I, I have to do this. I have to be angry when somebody says this to me. You know? Are, are, you know? I, I have to have my space or else. Do, do you see all that? beginning to take shape enslavement sin anything that trap us you know think about your own life right now think about things that you may have taken for granted everything okay that you may have taken for granted you, you live with it all these years and you thought to yourself you know what that's just me. That's just me. You have to accept me. In a very self-centered culture like ours, individualistic culture like ours, we have worshipped a God of the self. And we don't even know it. Okay? That's the problem. That is a problem. <sighs> is, it, is it so hard to imagine that a born-again Christian, an evangelical born-again Christian, can also be enslaved by sin? Is it that hard to imagine? We've uh, we felt we're entitled to this, this faith by birth, by the rituals, and by our profession. But what Jesus is really saying is that if you're true disciples of mine, you follow my ways. And you need to be set free from all the bondages. Don't be a slave to them. Master your stomach. Master your personality. Master your own problems. Don't make it a problem for other people or don't make it a problem for yourself. Breakthrough comes out of that. <laughs> All right, we got a couple more passages to go. And uh, let's take a look at verse 35, 36. Can we read it together? Now a slave has no permanent place in the family, but a son belongs to it forever. So if the son sets you free, you'll be free indeed. How many of you see yourself as a son? A daughter in the house of God you know how many of you feel that way okay okay how many of you feel like you're a servant or a slave now most people don't like to think that way 
But see, there, there are people who serve in the church. But after they serve in the church for some time, they walk away feeling sour, feeling bitter. You know, the, the Bible, you know, a lot of people's experience in serving God, they, they talk about the more you serve the Lord, the more bitter sweetness comes out. But, but it's, instead of bittersweet, it's bitter. It's just the bitterness comes out. Why is that? Why is that? Um, there are people who serve their family who walks away feeling bitter about service. You know, I know, I know some housewives feels bitter. Some husbands feel bitter about serving the family by working hard, you know. And there are kids who do chores at home feeling bitter. Is that, you know, why, why is it me all the time? Why, why not him? For the longest time at, at home, I, I, you know, I did all kinds of things at home. Can you believe that? When I was a kid, 12 years old, I, you know, I did everything at home. All, the, all, all through high school, I painted the fence, I take out the trash, I do dishes, I cooked, I do laundry for the whole family, five, five members in my family. I can tell you that there was a lot of bitterness. A lot of bitterness. I felt I need to do it. I felt I had to do it. I felt like a slave, even though I felt the responsibility for it. But I never felt like this, this was my home. Are you with me? There's a difference. The difference between a servant, a slave, versus someone who, like a son or a daughter, is it's a matter of identity. Who are you? Who are you? What is your relationship with the owner of the house? You know? People serve God in the church. They feel bitter because they're looking at other people, whether or not their other people are serving. Maybe they got in with the wrong motives. But think about that. Here, you, the, the passage talks about, you know, that a slave has no permanent place. In, in other words, he has no inheritance. And what does that mean? If you have inheritance, it means that this is yours. This is actually yours. The kingdom of God is actually yours. Oh, no, 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 I don't want to be so selfish. I don't want to be so, you know, thinking of myself. No, 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 you should. You should think about it. You should think about God's family is my family. God's household is mine. The kingdom of God is mine. <laughs> that sounds so, so egotistical. It? It's my, my kingdom. No, no, I don't mean that way. But, but you, you have an ownership. You, you know what I'm talking about? You, 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 you have an inheritance in this. There, there's, you have a stake in it. All right? You should be part of that. All right? Don't, don't, don't think of it as a, some kind of a maniac. <laughs> but, but you do have a stake in it. It's, it's yours. And the reason you serve is not because you're a slave. Because a slave or a servant doesn't understand the heart of the master. But if you're a member of the household, you understand the heart of the master. And how would you get there? How would you get there? It's not just a propositional knowledge about God. It's not just a propositional knowledge about His ways. It is an experiential knowledge. Having that intimate relationship with God, following His ways, and having His will fulfilled in your life. And that merger, that combination, and, and that brings a person into a true ownership into the kingdom. Amen? That's the way it goes. Freedom is a matter of identity. True freedom is knowing who you are and what you're called to do. There is a trust relationship the Father has with you. There's a sense of responsibility that you have for Him. But clearly, you know who you are, your identity defines you. Your identity defines you. Okay, and here's our last, last two verses. Can we read together? Verse 37 and 38. 
I know that you are Abraham's descendants, yet you are looking for a way to kill me because you have no room for my word. I'm telling you what I have seen in the Father's presence, and you are doing what you have heard from your father. And he goes on in the later part of this chapter, talks about, oh, actually you're not the descendant of Abraham, but you're actually descendant of the evil one. Whoo, I don't want to get there, okay? That's not the intention this morning to, to tell... That's not the intention. We're not getting there, okay? Even though the passage went all the way that far, but we can study it another time. But this morning, I want us to stay here for a little while. We don't need to go there. But this passage reminds us of something. True freedom, true freedom begins with the heart. True freedom begins with the heart. Can you say, I follow the way of Jesus? Can I f follow the ways of Jesus? And you have a lot of conflict inside. You actually have a hard time with this teaching. To the point, these Jews, these God-believing people that, that, that Jesus, at least, Jesus professed that they believed in His words, are actually plotting to kill Him. That's how far it can go. Now, Okay, let's be honest. Today, we're, we're mostly a friend's basis, you know. We're still friends. But is it possible the next moment we turn on each other? Is it possible? The heart, the heart is deceptive. The heart is evil. All you need to do is introduce a certain, certain idea. Ah, James Cho is doing that. Aha. <laughs> uh -huh. Oh, Lillian is doing that. Whoo, boy. All we have to do is introduce a little bit of that funny idea. It's not funny, but, but you know what I'm talking about, right? Right away, some of the best friends, boom, turn against each other. Ooh. Ooh, dangerous stuff, the heart. The heart is so dangerous, so sneaky, and that, that divides the church, divides people, divides friends, even marriages, family, workplace. Whew. Dangerous. The heart. So what does it mean to have true freedom? Freedom. Having the truth. Having freedom. Freedom setting us free. Setting us free. What does that mean? Oh, the heart, your action, experience, come full circle. Full circle. From your heart to your action, experiencing God, everything. See, now a lot of times, because we're so propositional in our thinking, because we're so propositional in our thinking, a lot of hypothesis, just introducing a certain idea, can take us off in a tangent. Do you believe in that? Just a hypothesis. Suppose Jerry is doing this and that or that. Suppose. Because there is no real experience of my relationship with Jerry, because I don't know Jerry in an experiential way, but all my knowledge of him is propositional. Therefore, my propositional hypothesis could also be equally true about who Jerry is. Are you with me? If our relationship is based on propositional knowledge, my hypothesis, hypothesis about something propositionally is equally as true as every other propositional knowledge I have of him. Am, are you following? Is this too heady for you guys? <laughs> but if I have experiential knowledge of Jerry, my hypothetical proposition of Jerry could be easily nullified because I have experience with Jerry. Are you with me? Do you understand why these people want to kill Jesus? It's all because of hypothesis. Jesus came to sabotage our faith. Is there any truth to that? 
what it looks like. He, he's inciting people against us. He's inciting people against us. He, he's inciting people against the traditional ways. He, he's distorting our, our tradition and he's devaluing all the things that we've done over the years. Think about that. He's so subversive that we should be afraid of him. Maybe we should kill him. Let's kill him. Yeah, that's right. Yep, once we kill him, everything will go back to normal. Are you with me? This is a hypothetical situation. There is no real experience of that reality, yet because of that hypothetical propositional knowledge, people can just change their heart easily, instantly. Ah, trust between a wife and a husband. Oh, the husband's been out for a whole month. I wonder who's been traveling with. <laughs> Fat Texan lady. <laughs> Our mind goes wild. Are you with me? With propositional hypotheses. We can make up story by ourselves, about other people, every day. If all we live on is just pure knowledge, nothing tangible to hold on, my friends. What we do need is some experiential knowledge of truth. Truth set us free. Wouldn't it be nice to know the truth about your husband or your wife? Truth set you free. You don't need to wonder why. And your purpose in life, truth set you free because you're actually loved. You know that you're actually loved. And you have a great benefit that comes as a result of knowing all that. Isn't that amazing? That's beautiful. Why would you not feel the freedom of Christ? Why would you not freedom, feel the freedom in Jesus? See, that's what's wrong. That's what's wrong with our world today. Living without following. Knowing without experiencing. And that's what Jesus wanted to bring us. A, to a true saving knowledge of His Son. By walking together with the Spirit. Every day. Every day. Um, when you walk with the Lord, will there be hard times? Will there be challenging times? Amen. I want to remind you all that. I don't want you to walk away too happy, okay? <laughs> there will be times that are challenging, really challenging times. How do you walk out of the boat? How do you walk out of the boat? Um, small step of faith. Just a really small step of faith. And but once you walk out of the boat, you can practice walking on water. Freedom. Let us pray.